There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places, writes poet Wendell Berry. 20 years ago, I lived in Southern California, just south of LA in Orange County. I had a favorite drive I would take with my children. We would drive from our house in Irvine down Newport Coast Road to the ocean. This was my favorite drive because on either side of the road were rolling hills, sparkling green in the spring after the winter rains, and around the final bend, the hills opened up and the entire ocean would suddenly be spread out in front of us. One day we were taking this drive, and as I pulled around the final bend, I noticed that the top of one of the rolling hills had been completely chopped off, and sitting atop it were several bulldozers and large dump trucks. Every cell in my body responded and cried out in pain. They were clearing it for development. I grew up spending my summers at the New Jersey shore. A few weeks after Superstorm Sandy, I headed down to Long Beach Island where my family had owned a house. We drove down the boulevard on that chilly spring day and surveyed the damage. Houses that were set for demolition had black X's painted across their fronts. Other houses on high stilts had their utilities laid bare beneath them, wires and pipes leading to nowhere. Front steps stood 10 feet above the ground because the sand had been swept away by the tide. Douglas Christie, in his book, Blue Sapphire of the Mind, tells a story of being at a summer conference where the participants had just spent their time reflecting on the place of the natural world in their teaching and writing. The last day of the conference, they found themselves talking about the places that they held dear. Childhood places, wild places, ordinary backyard places, places where some intimate connection had been born or nurtured. He writes, but gradually the conversation turned to feelings of loss that we carried within us. Many of these places no longer existed. Now, mostly paved over, plowed under, raised for one sort of development or another. The mood in the room darkened. We found ourselves speaking to one another through tears, through an immense grief that until that moment had been moving beneath the surface of our conversations. Environmental philosopher Glenn Albrecht has coined the term solastalgia, a word he describes as capturing the lived experience of negative environmental change. He goes on to write that solastalgia, more specifically, is the homesickness you have when you are still at home, but home has changed. Artist Gwen Curry has two art exhibitions, one titled Song of the Dodo and another Void Field. Song of the Dodo is a wall exhibit and Void Field is a floor exhibit. Both are a series of memorial tiles that honor animals who have gone extinct and the year of their extinction. I have been thinking about mourning this week of Halloween, All Saints, and All Souls Days. It is a time for mourning for those who have gone before us, those beloved others who have touched our lives in some way. So I want to ask you, who or what do we consider mournable or grievable? Can we mourn for those more than human others, those places, those creatures? What is the role of mourning? What is the role of grief in the process of remembering, of reconnecting? In the 1980s, the AIDS crisis rendered some bodies as ungrievable until a carpet of quilts commemorating those who had died graced the mall in Washington, D.C. Those who had been considered ungrievable by some 
became grievable in a very public way. In the same way, the individual grief experiences of environmental degradation can be made public in ways that honor the depths of the loss. But in our industrialized culture, we have forms of resistance to this kind of public grief. Francis Weller writes in his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, the primary sins of Western culture are amnesia and anesthesia. We forget and we grow numb. He writes, we forget we are all tangled together in this nest of life, that the air we breathe is shared, as is our water and soil, and that everything is bound together in a seamless web of life. When we forget, we are able to do untold damage to our watersheds, to one another, and to the earth. It is this amnesia that Douglas Christie sees our habit of evading knowing, of refusing to see and take responsibility for our complicity in the destruction of the world. Our inability to mourn, he writes, is an expression of the profound moral emptiness that afflicts us all. A friend of mine recently told me she was helping to teach a class on nature writing to college students, most of whom had no connection to the natural world, and in one case had open contempt for it. This disconnection feeds into the numbness and the evading knowing. These students are well insulated from the collective grief. In the continuation of the Wendell Berry poem I started with, Berry offers additional advice to poets, advice that these writing students should be aware of. He writes, breathe with unconditional breath, the unconditioned air, shun the electric wire, communicate slowly, live a three-dimensional life, stay away from screens, stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. Grief and mourning are forms of remembering and reconnecting, of bringing to the fore those things that are oftentimes painful. Douglas Christie writes, these losses are often, though not always, bound up together in our imaginations. The loss of places and particular life forms becoming part of a larger, more encompassing loss, so large that the imagination struggles to take it in or grieve for it. Yet our grief now includes the loss of something that is truly global in character and possessing an almost unimaginable reach. What do we do with this? In their essay, To More and Beyond the Human, Ashley Consolo and Karen Landman write that mourning is a cultural, political, and ethical practice. They quote Judith Butler, who wrote, perhaps mourning has to do with agreeing to undergo a transformation, the full result of which we cannot know in advance. They suggest that mourning is both individualizing and unifying. That mourning can either be experienced quietly and privately, making us feel separated and alone, or experienced collectively, uniting us with bodies, places, and events beyond ourselves, and even beyond our own immediate geographic locale or personal sphere. This kind of mourning is empowering, helping us realize that what we are feeling what we are experiencing is not simply our own, but part of a larger collective grief. It allows us to connect with each other through loss and shared vulnerability. It allows us to mourn what the dominant culture has deemed unmournable and can also encourage individual and collective action. Consolo writes, without speaking about loss, and without participating in the work of mourning, psychological change, 
transformation and resilience might be hindered. For religious communities, what does an acting public mourning for the more than human world look like? Nancy Menning, religious scholar and environmental activist, in her essay, Environmental Mourning and the Religious Imagination, writes, we don't grieve abstractly. We mourn the losses of people, places, animals, objects, and ideas to whom and to which we are attached. Grief is our response to loss. Mourning is what we do with that grief. She says that environmental losses are different than individual human losses because we are mourning not only what we have lost, but also what we have destroyed. She writes, when we feel complicit, whether directly or indirectly, and the loss being mourned, guilt intertwines with sorrow, complicating the grieving process. So she suggests that rituals around mourning environmental losses must be linked to the specificity of those losses, but they also need to address and transform feelings of guilt and remorse. Not in ways that relieve us of our responsibility, but in ways that might deepen our commitment to ongoing environmental activism that might forestall, mitigate, or prevent future losses. And along with rituals, she suggests ongoing spiritual practices that sustain what we have learned through ritual. She says that rituals provide a temporal, spatial, and social framework upon which to begin reorienting what has become disoriented. Practices sustain the commitment to mourning and may help us become the kind of people who are resilient in the face of impermanence. Grief and mourning in these public ways force not only remembering, but also reconnection. Reconnection with our sense of the sensual, the beautiful, that which fills us with wonder and awe. Instead of the numbness which Francis Weller writes about, we might discover the aliveness of interacting with the more than human world and with the connection to others in our effort to experience our collective grief. It is sometimes hard for me to revisit the places I have loved. I know they are not going to be the same as they were when I knew them the first time. Places in Southern California where I lived 20 years ago are changed beyond my recognition. The island in New Jersey where I grew up has not just been changed by Superstorm Sandy, but also by overdevelopment that denuded it of almost anything that was green. The orchard that grew next to my grammar school is gone, and the farms where we got produce when I was a child are now suburban subdivisions. Even in the relatively rural area where I live now, my neighbors have noticed a decrease in songbirds, and the frogs that I love to listen to that mark the seasons for me the last few years have had their mating ritual, which I love so much, disrupted because the spring weather has been so erratic as the result of climate change. All of you out there, where are the places you love? Where are the places that you mourn that are never coming back? How do you wish to mourn them? In what ways are we going to re-engage with the beauty and wonder that we still have available to us? How are we going to embrace our mourning in a way that helps us protect that which we have left? How are we going to redefine what we consider grievable and mournable in the more than human world? How are we going to transform that grief and mourning into action that may save those places and creatures that are sitting on the brink of extinctions, but that might still yet have a chance. This week I attended Mass for All Saints Day. In the Mass there was a collective remembering of those saints who hold particular significance in the Church. We sang this remembrance in what is called a litany of the saints. We brought them into the room with us, 
St. Francis and Claire, obscure saints most people have forgotten, like saints Athanasius and Cosmos. After seeing a series of names, we would intone, pray for us. The repeated line that breaks up the song is, all you holy men and women, pray for us. When we think of all the places and creatures that we also mourn, maybe we might like to call them into the room with us. The dodo, the passenger pigeon, the Arizona jaguar, the Colorado River Delta, with the intervening repeated line, all you holy rocks, trees, rivers, pray for us. Amen and blessed be.